I am your host for, for this panel. My name is Mariam. Um, I work in a small venue in Belgium. It's called 4AD. It has nothing to do with the label. We just share the name. Um, we've been in several uh, European projects on venue cooperation in the past. And it's actually this venue cooperation which brought me to the first edition of MENT. Be it on this side of the table. Um, as part of the first venues panel. And that time we were talking about the same issues, the, the real challenges for, for European venues. So I'm very happy to be here today and to uh, host this interesting panel with representatives of four uh, very diverse and interesting venues uh, from all over Europe. And I'm happy to be able to question them on topics which also um, are interesting to my venue. Um, and I'm pretty sure that today will make me wiser, and I hope it will be the same for you guys. Um, uh, before I give the word to the panelists to shortly introduce themselves, I would like to inform you that we will leave some time for questions at the end of the panel, uh, some 10 minutes. Um, of course, if you want to interact more early, feel free to do so. Uh, but I'll make sure that there's time enough, so I'll keep a strict eye on the clock. Uh, but let's just uh, first start with a quick presentation of the panelists. Um, maybe Kaya, you can, uh, oh my God. you can start. You have one and, a half, one. one and a half minute. Shorter uh, is also. <laughs> I'll be shorter. Um, okay, my name is Kaya. I work as a venue manager at Gala Gala. Um, this is a venue for 350 people. And we have um, built also a summer garden behind the club, uh, which is for kind of 700-ish people. Um, I've been doing this job for 19 years, which is kind of long. So if anybody wants to take my place, just raise your hand, please. <laughs> but it's not um, easy. I have to tell you that. Okay, Frank? Yeah, hello, my name is Frank. Um, I'm the booker for uh, German venue Class 22, which means Track 22 in English. And we're a 300 capacity uh, place. Uh, we also book uh, some shows at bigger uh, um, places. And uh, yeah, I'd like to meet all the other people here and uh, hear some interesting stories. Hi, everybody. I'm um, Balak Shosh. I'm from Budapest. And I'm, uh, representing uh, A38, uh, 700 capacity venue in Budapest. Um, beside this um, capacity, we also book shows, uh, usually bigger shows, um, with um, 1600 cap max, so um, that's all so far. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have any questions, just bomb us at the end of the panel. I'm Ben, I'm from the Paradiso in Amsterdam, in Holland. Um, we have a venue, uh, with several venues, but like the main hall is like 1500 capacity, the smaller hall is 250 capacity, we've got a basement, we've got other places where we tend to promote uh, shows, and we're actually trying as a venue to accommodate as good as possible the band as such in every capacity they actually want to sell, but not 100,000, but about to 1,500 is the max. Okay, thank you. Um, first topic, um, as we all know, uh, venues tend to do a lot more than uh, putting up shows. Um, in fact, they are often praised for, for their strong identity and their unique identity. And we're lucky to have four quite iconic venues in this panel, um, and I would like to hear more about that. Um, I'll start with Frank, uh, because his venue uh, was voted in 2017 the most beloved venue of Germany. That's oh, wow. really interesting. <laughs> so, Frank, tell me what's the secret of Kleis 2020? Well, yeah, the, the, the secret is the labor of love. So, you have to really love what you're doing. I, I'm always after 29 years, I'm still loving that shit. It's, uh, I really love it. And um, I guess people can trust us. So uh, when I started going to the Gleis, um, there was a saying in Münster, 
on every Wednesday you can go to the guys, doesn't matter which band plays, it's always a good band and we kept to that. And yeah, maybe that's the secret. I don't know. <laughs> okay, and you started, uh, Gleis started as quite DIY and you still yeah. keep to that profile. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, it started totally DIY. Nowadays you cannot go totally DIY no. um, okay. without uh, yeah, going bankrupt. Um, and yeah, but it's, uh, it, it grew slowly and um, there was still, but everyone at Gleis still is into it because he or she loves it. Okay, yeah. that sounds nice. Uh, Bolesh, you are located on a ship. Um, <laughs> well, um, it's, um, the main thing with A38 is that um, there are like two important issues, I mean two important things. The first thing is, first things is that um, like we place to have any act and any band, no matter what the style is, it should be contemporary. I mean, that's the main point. The diversity is, was always important, and I strongly hope that it's going to be important in the future as well. The other thing is that um, that um, E38 lately become like not just a simple concert venue, but it's more like a cultural institution. We also have um, a broadcast department. We are also a live studio of um, a Hungarian TV channel, which is broadcasted from the venue daily with daily program. Plus, we are making um, 60, 60, 70 documentaries for the national television broadcasted five times a week. So you can imagine that how important this could be for an international act to come to Budapest to play for the first time, then we make a documentary about the band, then we screen it. So I guess it's a pretty big, big thing. Um, that's all so far, I guess. So diversity, um, no matter what the style is, it should be contemporary. And it's like more than a club, it's more like a cultural institution. Yeah, it's also... Uh, a lot of artists support you doing that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, ben, uh, Paradiso is quite an institute in Europe. <laughs> Tell us more about uh, the unique identity of, of your venue. Well, the unique uh, identity, more or less, I think, is that we exist for more than 50 years. So, um, history wise, you can expect everything. So, um, so, expect the unexpected. That means you can. Uh, Get new acts to see in small capacities, but also maybe get this bigger act. So it's always something not to be missed. And we are really into like, scouting for talent. We've got a record label um, and uh, for, for new Dutch acts. Um, and we, you know, just help them out a little bit on things. Um, well, we have, we have so much. We've got passes, we've got Try to get young people in with passes so they can go to concerts for a little bit of money, etc. etc. It's too much, really, yeah. too. too um, but, you know, you can expect everything. And I think that's something people really like. You know. Okay, you're also environmentally engaged, uh, I read on the website. Uh, yes, we, we try to make it as green as possible, and that's quite difficult. But we try to. We try to do like as wide as possible. All topics we uh, we put them on agenda and we talk about it. We have readings. We do many many things to make people aware about things. So, for example, a cow exam we had, so so that you know what bad things there are around the cows or good things. They taste well probably, but also things CO2 things like that were not so good. And we try to make people aware. We don't say we are like a political venue, but we put things on the agenda. And if it's music, it can be everything. Okay, Kaya, tell us something about uh, Galahal. Um, okay, our identity, I guess, is uh, strongly linked to Omedelkova city. Um, so we have a strong um, DIY backbone. Um, what can I say about this? Um, I'm not really sure if you get subsidies, you still, um, you know, like you are DIY or not, but um, 
I don't know. I think that people really uh, respect and feel the um, the club that is kind of uh, built from scratch. I guess we have also our own um, laws, or so to say, or moral standards, which are uh, maybe even higher than elsewhere. And um, as my colleague said. Um, I guess we have something for everybody and every time you come to Galahala there is something interesting to see, either it's a band or a party or whatever. And we also have an um, um, independent uh, record label, alternative record label, and we're quite proud of it and also the works uh, around the bands that we do. You all have a, a long history. Um, what would you advise uh, a young organization, a young value, just starting, regarding this identity? <laughs> they will have to work a lot, <laughs> work a lot <laughs> for not a lot of money, I guess. Patience. Patience. Yes. Patience yeah. Well, yeah, it's obvious that you all do a lot more than putting up shows. Um, and that's actually bringing me to a second topic, because um, despite these strong identities, venues are often uh, getting negative perceptions from local communities, local governments, for instance. Um, as one venue once put it, um, noisy places that create <coughs> nuisance where people drink too much beers. That's adults, beer. that's adults with reality, we all know that. <laughs> But um, I would like to know um, if you had problems with neighbors and how did you manage to get them solved? Did you get them solved? Um, and I will start with Ben uh, for this um, one. No, I think we're having trouble with neighbors for 50 years already. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the last year was really problematic. Um, and really problematic means that uh, they asked maybe to close down club nights and things like that. Um, and uh, well, a large part of our subsidy actually went to solutions we had to make. Um, it's a council building, we pay higher uh, rent, um, and we spent about 200,000 200, euros just on trying to get it good and not even just, you know, do something, but just people, pay, pay, uh, paying people. It's horrible. Really terrible, and it's all about gentrification. That people want to live in a city where everything's happening, but nobody wants uh, room around the street. But oh, they love it so much in the city. But <laughs> there it goes. Yeah. And do you act together with other venues in, in Amsterdam to to tackle this problem? Or well, there's a, there's a new thing like smoking is not allowed anymore in the, in in the venue itself. Um, outside is it's going to be a big problem for all people all restaurants, cafes, venues, and we're in the middle of the center. So I think in the end, um, there's going to be a lot of fun having like 10,000 of people on the street smoking and making noise. So I think in the end, it's good that the problem will be, you know, for everybody. So hopefully, get something going. Okay, <laughs> but you also um, try to um, invest in, in like programming for specific neighborhoods because Paradiso has many venues over the city. Can you tell us something about that? Um, we actually have a lot of things, places asking us whether we can help. And for example, one sort of squat kind of uh, 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 venue. And we, that's seen it all. And we helped them out. And, and in the end, we, um, 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 they managed to get subsidy for two years for 50,000 euros. So that they can do like a good startup kind of thing, and it's not that we, you know, we're like stifting, which means we're a non-profit organization, and we really like doing that. So we are not just a venue who just looks at itself, but we try to look at other and to get like a, a bigger, a nicer cultural vibe. Okay. Um, Kaya, you are located in a very particular area here in Ljubljana, which is a city in a city. And you have the same problems? Yeah, the same ones. Um, now, for three or four years, we have mostly <coughs> one big problem with one neighbors that came four years ago uh, to our neighborhood, and they're constantly calling the police. 
So it is a big problem, and they come every time they come. Um, so is it only one person? Like it's only one, one person. Uh, yeah, so like in ninety-nine percent, it's one person, one family. Um, I think that they bought this house or actually an apartment uh, for a bit of lower cost, and they probably came like at 10 o'clock in the morning, every time, or at the day daytime. Um, and the first time that they slept over there, <laughs> they were like, no. Um, so yeah, we, we had uh, a huge meeting with the mayor and um, the neighbors and the police and everybody involved. And so we had some peace and quiet for the next two months. But um, it didn't stick, so we're in an ongoing process. Their building is actually totally uninsulated. They haven't done nothing. Uh, sorry. Uh, we are not actually, we cannot talk with them because they don't want to. So it's a problem. Um, I was thinking, for example, that uh, we can maybe put money together with them to insulate their house because they have uh, we have done it with our clubs, uh, but it's a no go. <laughs> so I was really looking forward to see how you all dealt with that, but I guess it's, it's the same story. Like yeah, we actually have the the, uh, the neighbors' houses uh, isolated. Uh -huh. windows, you double, win double windows and things like that. It's, you, you it's horrible. You invested in that? Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> and it's still, it still it didn't solve the problem. No, the problem is not as such that, that, that we're too loud, but it's an old building, it's 19th century. But it's, it's, it's the people on the street. We have to have like... Ah, okay. So we have like... Three, four, no, two. On the nights we have two people outside walking around to, oh, keep, to keep people quiet and cost them a lot of money. It's really expensive to do these kind of things. So, uh, and I think it's also a council problem. You're living in one of the most busiest uh, uh, squares in, 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 in Europe. So it's 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 a bit it's crazy. Do you have problems? No, actually, we are um, very lucky with this. I mean. We do have problems, but we don't have a noise problem actually, um, because actually A38 is parking on the Danube, it's a ship, you probably know that. And um, just right in front of the venue, it's actually the University City, and the other part of the, the river is um, um, office buildings. Um, so we have a really strict uh, uh, thing that. Um, when, during the summertime, when we have these uh, terrace parties or smaller shows, we have a, a um, um, straight 10 uh, uh, p.m. curfew. So after 10 p.m., there is only um, the, the show is only happening inside the main concert hall, which is absolutely uh, um, soundproof. Yeah. So we do have many problems, but we don't have this one. So we're lucky. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, well, I don't know for you, Frank, uh, you have yeah, something yeah, we, to add? Yeah, we used to have problems like 10, 15 years ago okay. with neighbors, but um, we, uh, the city invested in good sound insulation um, for, for the glass, and um, yeah, it's uh, called track 22, so we're close to the train station, it's already a noisy area, so people who move there should know it's noisy, and it's okay, for us it's okay, yeah. <coughs> well, it seems to be... A problem, and the good thing is that there uh, has been this call for a small venue cooperation by Creative, launched, launched by Creative Europe, and this was one of the topics, uh, like uh, interacting with your local communities and local governments, and uh, really uh, talking about these issues and putting them on the agenda. So it's a good thing uh, that Europe's jumped on it. So hopefully, uh, yeah. There will be better solutions coming out of it. Um, I think in Germany they, they've done already some, some work on that in Berlin um, and in Hamburg um, by making a map of all the, the live venues and interacting with the local governments and, and building promoters and stuff. But I think there's still a lot of work to do on, on that one. I think they help in the bigger cities, yes. Yeah, the bigger cities, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, maybe something else. Um, 
something completely different. <laughs> when I was here five years ago, a topic that came up was um, attracting a younger audience to your venues. Um, it's something at that time that was getting more and more difficult, a really long time. Um, many venues are struggling to, to get a crowd, uh, a young crowd, like minus 25 for, for their live uh, shows. Actually, their core business. Um, is this something you also um, encounter in your venues? Um, and what do you do about it uh, actively, um, Hank? <laughs> yeah, we're quite lucky because everyone is going. It used to be a problem to get older people into the venue because it was the punk venue of Münster. And uh, yeah, but everyone is coming, so it's, it's really nice. And how do you do that? Everyone is uh, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's a grown thing. Like We have a, also a very young uh, team and they also support me in booking shows. So um, I'm not only booking like old fart bands. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not at all interested in old fart bands, but um, if you get older, maybe you book some older bands. And uh, But I try to focus on younger and older bands and uh, it's a good mixture. Is anyone of you guys having a um, problem with getting a, a middle-aged audience? I'm, I wouldn't call it a problem. It's more like um, um, something we really want to solve that to to get all the uh, all a uh, all I mean all ages of audience into the venue and it's um, we are lucky enough to to that we are like um, uh, three of us booking all the shows and three of us uh, mainly concentrate on their own field uh, divided by music genres and of course we do have like ones sometimes we just discuss with each other, with each other that what we think about specific bands but it's it's mostly I think it's about like as Frank said it's about programming that you just have to find a way to book acts what what's for a younger audience then the younger audience will surely come so it's it's mostly about that I think if I can say something yeah. I think that uh, the best thing is to give um, you have to teach them of course and um, show them everything but uh, to give uh, young organizers to be uh, the chance to do parties or um, concerts their, their own program, program. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. and this is all the main of you thing. do that work with young yeah, with creators yeah. yeah we also have a young team who book some smaller shows and uh, they do totally the DIY um, on their own costs and uh, yeah it's a good mixture we also have one really older guy who only does garage punk shows and yeah it's a good mixture the diversities, I think, of the programming and... Do you all work with volunteers or...? No? Okay. no? Yes, I'm all volunteers. They get paid, but it's quite voluntary. On, um, on, on program level, on booking, Book, just yeah. professionals. Yeah, okay, yeah. And for, like, uh, helping out in the club? Uh, uh, no. No. Not really, like, no, like, um, yeah, ticket handler, handlers and, um, um, Sometimes, if there's a local lack, like roadies, but nothing more serious. I try to pay everybody because I think it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I don't know in Germany is voluntary work paid or it's paid. Yeah, but is, yeah. For example, I am not a full-time uh, booker. I only have officially eight hours paid. So yeah, but I invest quite more. But I, as I work for the city of Münster, it's it's okay. But yeah, so it's it's pretty cheap what they do uh, to have a good venue, and uh, they should invest more. But we're happy with what we have. <laughs> well, in Belgium, lots of venues have, have volunteers, very young ones, and mm. it's also good to to get uh, the right mixture of audience in your place. And um, yeah, it's a nice thing. Um, Mm, something different as well. Um, it's a it's a topic that uh, you guys uh, asked me to put on on the list today. Um, it's a hard one, I think, and we could talk about it a long time because it's, it involves a social thing as well. Uh, I want to talk with you guys about gender, 
and how uh, women are represented in your venues and what you actually actively do about that. Because I've done some research uh, for Belgium and it's actually very deploring the situation. Um, in Belgium, 25% only uh, of the workers in live music venues are female, which is not a lot. Um, if you compare it to the European average, it's 40%. So the more north you go, the better um, the representation is. Um, and what I also noticed is that we do not have female workers or female venue coordinators um, in Belgium, not that I know, and uh, almost no female bookers also working in a venue. So that's quite something. Um, most people work in communication maintenance uh, or administration. Um, I would like to ask, how is the situation in your country and um, do you tackle this issue actively, Ben? Yeah, we actually do. Um, I think, uh, and it uh, was quite a while ago, we just made a choice. And uh, a month ago we had like six female promoters and two males, and now we have two new ones and one male, so to get it right. Um, the head of finance is, is um, female, the head of production is female, head of the, like, who's doing like the daily uh, work, coordination of the people behind the bar, things like that, is female. Um, but, you know, you have to make the choice. And that's the way it is. And, and, and also, what I think is really important is that um, the bands you book, actually, you, you can make sure after some time that the people who actually come to your venue feel comfortable coming to those shows, like the whole LGBTQ kind of concerts we, we put in the cloud, a lot also like club nights and things like that. So at some point these people also want to work at the parody so, so and it's all about a, a more colored kind of music. So if you invest in that kind of thing, in the end you also get different people in your venue. So not only male, female, but also the first day inclusivity. So that's what we do, and for quite a long time, and it works really well. And uh, because we've got many people who do not leave, <laughs> including me, um, and you've got a lot of experience. So if you have a new one in, you can just incorporate and make sure everybody gets the same quality. Because the level we are working on is, is, is quite high. We get like really big ends. So if you have new people, you have to be sure that they are being introduced in the right way as well. So, and that's what, uh, I, yeah, that's what we're doing. And I'm really happy with it because uh, the whole males, I mean, come on, too many males on the, on the floor is not so good. So, we too. Bolesh, what about uh, the situation? It's um, just almost the same, just what Ben mentioned. I, I guess it's just pretty healthy. Um, just to see a couple of examples, like head of marketing is a girl, like head of booking is a girl, like one of the CEOs is, is a girl. So it just, well, it just, I, I would say it's not really an issue. I think it's more about the the, 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 the background, the, the quality of the job, the quality of the, the, the work somebody can do. So I would say it's, it's pretty healthy. We, well, it's all right. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah, we always had kind of a 50-50 female male team, so all the time, and it's quite a good situation, but um, I know that in Germany most clubs are run by men, and especially agencies. For example, I had a, a female friend from Hamburg, she asked me if I know a girl booker uh, for a, a, band from, a girl band from Canada, and I had to think really, really hard. If uh, uh, I knew some agents, but uh, they are sub agents, or maybe uh, they do only administrative works, and I, I, I came across two. So, yeah. How would you explain that? I don't know. Um, it changes. So uh, there was a new. Uh, there's a new agency in Germany, and they, um, <clears throat> and they on their Facebook page, page they mentioned all the bookers. And it was all men, and the first comments was all girls uh, commenting on that. That's uh, so male dominated. I was like a, a well-known girl 
musicians from Germany, uh, from Germany, Cat Frankie, she commented on that. And so there's, uh, I, I hope it changes, but yeah, it's difficult, I think, especially in the, in the promoter, in the, in the agent section, but yeah, I hope it changes because there are so many bands with girls or full girl bands also playing at the Gleis all the time. And if you go to Rapervan Festival, I saw so many girl bands in the last few years, so it, it, it should change. Is it, is it because of the quotas? Or, you know, the quotas? No, I, I don't think so, no. Okay. How is the situation in Slovenia? Oh, Slovenia is cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, kind of, kind of had uh, the opposite problem. I mean, like three years ago, okay. it was like 70, 80 percent of girls, and now we're like half half, so it's cool. Um, I don't know. I think, like he said, it's about. I mean, anybody can do anything. I'd say. Although I would um, say that a venue manager, um, if you're a girl thinking about doing this for a longer period of time, um, you can just say no to having kids. That was also a question. I'm sorry, it's a brutal truth because you cannot work uh, all the day and then go to the venue when you have shows and be there. And we are no saints, we drink a lot of alcohol, um, we stay up late, we sleep too little, we, um, we are stressed a lot. Um, so it's not really a perfect healthy environment, would you agree, my fellow venue managers? Well, I mean, we have a lack, I, mean, I, I understand what you're talking about really, I mean, <laughs> clearly, but um, we do have a um, um, lucky situation that um, I mean, I'm, I'm a booker, so I, I just advance everything. I don't even have to be at a show. I mean, of course I'm at a show, but I book because I care or I want to meet the band or probably the agent of the band come over. But that's over. the right way. You have I mean, to be there. No, 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 no. And we do have a production manager. We do have, um, um, like, all the... Um, yeah, but if you're a booker, you have to see how the show goes. If yeah, you yeah. cannot just, you know, yeah. have the But I just can't. Feedback. If I do, like, 60 a year, I can't go to every show. Not it's not possible. Every, but and the other thing is, and there is a very funny situation, that sometimes I do shows and not having a chance to go to the show when they play in Budapest, but I sold them somewhere else. So I know what I'm expecting, mm -hmm. <laughs> actually. So, uh, but I know what you're saying. But it's really, it could be another topic, actually, like a whole panel that the mental, um, the mental, mental, health. mental <laughs> health and mental issues within the music business, because it's really it could be a serious topic. I, I, I think so. It's maybe a good idea for for next year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, um, diversity. Gender-wise, um, I want to talk about diversity um, on stage, and um, you, Bonosh, you told me already that's really something you strive for at A38 to have like a diverse programming. Does that also mean um, lots of different European acts, uh, all nationalities? Oh yeah, I mean it's it's. It's not. It's it's never a question of. It's never about where the band is from, or it's never about what gender the members of the band. It's it's never about the the, the style of the band. It's 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 always about the, the the quality of the band, or the originality of the band, or the or or the hype of the band. Of course, because we have to sell tickets, and that's a main main uh, uh, priority. Yeah. It's a harsh truth, but it is. So, um, yeah, as I just said before, it's no matter what the style is or what the, gen what the genre of the, the, the music is, it just um, have to be quality, like, um, 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 like, like really good, like original, and then we are good to give a shot. I mean, you can always do, can, can do some research that what the, what the band first ticket, ticket twice. So, yeah, I mean, we are very happy with the way how we work that a day we do have a Scandinavian black metal band and the other the other day a really sophisticated singer-songwriter. 
But you are part of uh, Life Europe? Yes, we are. Uh, yeah, that's a, a funding. Maybe you can explain that uh, uh, to um, you, Well, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a European fund, and at the moment, I'm not quite sure that how many club is a part of the Life Europe program, probably probably 12 or 14. I'm sorry about that, I don't know how, that I don't, I'm not having all the details because I do have a colleague who is um, representing my venue at the Live Europe Committee. And the, the main uh, benefit of this program is that um, actually uh, we are having a quota that we can have like a specific, specific number of acts from all European countries and there are criterias and if the band is good with these criterias we can have money or we can spend the spend on the the, the fee of the band so it's a really lucky situation and I, I guess it's a really good program because we have many bands what we could have through this program and then the band can, and the band came back a couple of years probably a year later with a new record and we just didn't need the subsidy anymore because they could sell tickets so, so that's 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 a really good thing, I believe. Yeah. So these funding mechanisms can help to make exactly. programs Indeed. more diverse. Indeed. Do you agree, Kaya? <laughs> I don't know. I um, I think we book bands by their quality. Not you know, it's the same as yeah. You know, I didn't January, tell you that I've book yeah, a band if it's yeah. shitty, but I want to have the subsidy. Uh, I want. I Thing. I I had a cycle actually uh, that was called Attention New Band on Scene for a few years that was made especially for this because um, yeah our problem was, was also we saw a band that was worth of booking but how to persuade the Vin audience or the young audience to come to the show so um, we kind of branded it um, and it, at the beginning it was okay, and people came, uh, but it was um, without entrance fee. Uh, people only put the exit fee, so it was well written, like if you like the band, then you can put some money inside, inside whatever. Um, but people were really, really ecstatic <laughs> on the show, for example, and then they put like 20 cents inside the box. So I was like, no, <laughs> let's not do that anymore. But yeah, I, I, I personally don't like, not the quotas, so not, nothing like that. So we, we book by, by quality. Okay. Um, brings me to my next question, uh, which was in the intro text. How to sell out a venue with promising lesser known acts? I have an answer for that. Hard. <laughs> Hard. Uh, sorry. Selling out a venue is so, <laughs> whoa, like how to sell 100 tickets, not possible. I mean, it's possible, of course it is, but uh, if you have a lesser known band, you have to put twice as much of uh, promotion and um, a lot of work and uh, pulling your friends like, yeah, this one is really good, come, come. Um, but it, it, it can happen. Not to sell all the venue, that is a little bit like off, but um, to sell 100 tickets is possible. But you, Ben, um, you, you do that. You, if, if there's a promising act, you really believe in it and you know ticket sales won't be big, you make, you make a, I'm, the balance. I'm, I'm, I'm in a lucky position that our venue is in Amsterdam and mm -hmm. everybody wants to play Amsterdam. And we have to make uh, advantage of that, which we do. Um, and last few so maybe we just try to keep as close to us as possible and have them come back as often as possible. And it's music that we believe in. And nine times out of ten, it actually does work. It's it takes, it, it and takes a lot of work in the end. Yeah. For example, I'm not there, but uh, tonight Angel Olsen is playing. So we built it really slowly, and now she's almost selling out the main hall. So things like that. Or, um, can give more examples, but like King Gizzard, etc. etc. So, yes, we have the advantage we can start small, everybody wants to play Amsterdam, and you can, I'm not saying you can have them as often as you wish yourselves, because you know, you have to think about the band has to play other places as well, obviously. Um, but 
church here, and we've got the showcase festival as well, like London Calling, where we, for 25 years, 30 years maybe already, where we um, put on new unknown acts, and we try to, you know, have their first encounter uh, at the parody, so, so it helps a lot as well. So I think in the end it's also important that you can have them back because they really liked it in the first place. So, but yeah, you have to invest. Yeah. You can't get it for nothing. No, it's investing, making choices. Do you agree? I would, uh, yeah, I mean, um, actually, if, if I, no matter how much I love the band, if I'm not concerned, they will sell at least the 40 or 50 percent of the, the capacity. I'm, I'm not looking at I mean, you know, it's not my personal taste, that's my job. So, um, or I send them to a rock pub, to downtown. So, it's that easy. I mean, just not, I mean, it's it's a profession, it's a, it's a job. I mean, of course, it's really important to have your personal taste, but it's not about that. I mean, it's not, not, not the first and main issue that the, the program should represent my style or my, my, my taste. Okay. Oh. I guess. Uh, well, it's all about mixed, ca mixed calculation at, at ours. And um, we cannot book every band we want. But if I want a re band really hard and there are, at the show there are around 20 people, it's kind of, it frustrates me, but if they are good, I will book them again. Yeah. You will not cancel it. Um, if ticket sales are like five tickets, I would cancel it because it's, it's horrible for the band yeah. and we pay them. So it's, I hate this and it's so, it's, it's, I feel quite ashamed <clears throat> if I'm at such a show because I feel really bad for them. And, uh, but I, if I really love a band, I book them. I would just like to add something. I think that <laughs> still it's much better to have 20 people that are really ecstatic and they love the show or whatever than a hundred or two hundred or three hundred that don't, they just don't care. Like, it happens a lot with showcases, for example. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. It's true, of course. Do you feel there's more competition nowadays than like, ten years ago? Of course. It's a, so, when we started, there was two clubs in Minnesota. And nowadays, 10, 15, and you can go. When I started, there was maybe one or two shows a week in Münster. Today, you can go to two or three shows in Münster, and it's uh, 300,000 people living in Münster, so who, who should go to all these shows? Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a lot. And um, why how do you have. Why is Munster so popular? So <laughs> We yeah, Munster is totally popular. Yeah. We're close to the Dutch border. We're not very good then. Lots of Dutch people are coming. <laughs> so, it's getting more difficult to, to get an interesting program or not? Yeah, sometimes, yes. And, yeah. and is it also because these venues may be um, legally or differently uh, organized? or? No, it's just the competition and it's also the competition because everyone has to play live as they don't uh, earn anything from record sales anymore. Exactly. So they have to tour and they, they, um, they, just, they focus on major cities because uh, a few years ago every band used to play at the Gleis because it was always en route to England, or to, the Dutch, uh, uh, to the Netherlands or to the northern countries. But nowadays, yeah, it changed. But it's okay for us, we're still doing okay, but um, there's a big change, yeah. Okay. We, for example, we have um, <clears throat> in Ljubljana, there's not so many people living, actually, and so the first competition is um, the fact that bars are doing this. They started to do a lot of shows. And you know, it's not a very good PA or whatever, but of course, bands take the chance. So well, that was the first one. Um, the second one was this great facility for us here, like Kino Shishka, that is really um, a big one. And not I'm not talking about the, the bigger um, venue, but the smaller yeah. one, of course, um, is a little bit of competition. Um, mostly because they are far more financed than 
we are, of course, and um, I don't know, but I like competition. Yeah, it makes you not fall asleep, yeah. you know? That's true. You work harder, it's okay. Yeah. And you, f you feel impact from, from festivals? Or, I don't know. Oh. Yeah, we do, definitely. Yeah. Also, a very popular yeah. festival city. <laughs> there you go again. Um, yeah, there are several things happening. People just want to be outside instead of inside. Uh, there are locations outside, so yeah, there's quite a few eggs in summer, especially, flowing away to uh, to other uh, locations. So you, okay. you program during the summer as well? Uh, or you keep yes, we're, the we're, op we're open 365 days a year. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's just no holidays. We were closed before we, we built up the summer garden. We were closed in, you know, like July and August. So yeah, of course. And uh, does any one of you have their own festival? Wish we could. <laughs> we have got a, a, a uh, milkshake. That's uh, an LGBTQ friendly festival. Okay. Uh, 15,000 people in Amsterdam. And uh, it sells out every year. Yeah. So that's really cool. Yeah. You, you know? yeah, we have a small one called Festival. Um, and sometimes uh, my co-worker does some bigger stuff also, um, yeah. but mostly not. Yeah. But I would just like to say this um, difference between club and festivals, which everybody know. But um, when you come to a club, to a concert, um, you have to pay attention to the band, and you do, actually. And when you come to the festival, you know how it is. You mingle, you talk, it, it's a totally different story. So, I don't know, I like clubs more than festivals. So, um, so we, we, A38 doesn't have his own, its own festival, but all the programmers work for festivals as bookers. So that's the thing. Like, and the um, one thing more which is really important that we are lucky enough that um, the second biggest stage of the SIGAT festival, it's called A38 stage, which is not totally booked by us, but we present uh, and suggest bands to the booking team of the SIGAT, which is a really important thing, I think. And um, that's, that's how we try to get involved in the festival business as well, that all the programmers work on their own to be involved. Okay, well, um, we'll keep that in mind. We like the venues, <laughs> also the festivals. Um, I think we have some time for questions, maybe? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Hi, um, uh, gonna give me the side. Uh, I'll just shoot. <laughs> Go to the toilet. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. <laughs> so, for you three. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned mental health. And I was just wondering, what do you as venues do regarding the mental health for your own employees? I can, uh, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can be really quick, unfortunately nothing. I mean, we don't, have, um, we don't have space and time for that, it was just like an idea, what I just tried to suggest, because, you know, we all know that how hard to be involved, like 24 hours, and 30 days a month to get involved with all the stress you have. So actually it's really good that that um, many showcase festivals, like the bigger ones like here, Sonic or Rickerman, having this kind of topic in their in their program. So I'm really curious that how this whole thing will end up. We'll see. But as for the A38, unfortunately we not involved to 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 be to be really honest. Well, we try to live in harmony. Which is, um, Can you live in harmony? I did myself. You know. Yeah, yourself. <laughs> what, what in the paradiso? But is this something that you are? I'm not cynical, by the way. I'm, trying, I'm just saying that it's very important that you talk with each other in that that um, you know, after your half yearly talks with all employees, if they have languages, there are people in paradiso as well. Two people. If you've got problems, you can go over there. 
like if you're sexual harassed or other things. So yes, we have some tools, but I think there are normal tools where we should be everywhere. So because we're not a small organization, so but we try to. It's it's not doesn't come from itself. So, yeah. Yeah, well, like we work on it's built on many shoulders. So a lot of people are working there, and they all enjoy working there. And, Oh, we have between eight and ten shows a month, so it's not every day, and um, that's always a different crew at night, so that's not that's not an issue for us. There was a question. Thank you. There, there was a question about uh, mental health. Oh, and like, so how how do you? take measurements or protect them from... It's a <laughs> hard topic, I'd say. I don't know what you talked about, but yeah. Um, I think we should talk more about it, but maybe not on this occasion. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> Ask. We said it all. We told them. We answered. We answered that. No one. Who wants to be a promoter? Yeah. Who wants to be a club promoter or a booker? Club promoter. Actually, who, who is a promoter or a booker? Okay. Do you have any questions? We're doing. <laughs> we're doing 250 shows a year. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I mean, I, I was, uh, yeah, I have many questions. <laughs> like, yeah, go, go ahead. Do. You want to have the mic? <laughs> uh, no. No, <laughs> just because of the recording. Well, I mean, I really don't have, like, one question. I would like yeah. to see with you and discuss uh, all your history and all the issues. Oh. Because I also run a venue, you know, I'm a booker. <laughs> It's similar to A38, it's like in Bratislava, in Slovakia, it's called Nova Cvernovka, so it's a culture center with a venue. So it's like a similar, but uh, we are really new, so we are like young. So uh, I know your venue, and it's a really great one. Uh, I haven't been, I've been to Galhalla, I haven't been to the others. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a like, particular question. I just but maybe I want to know, like, you know, um, do you think it's like possible to survive this? You know, we are at the beginning. We have like three years, and you you are like still here. So it's giving me hope that we can make it. But is there any advice from you, like to people who started venues? Well, the, 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 believe, in your, believe, uh, sorry, believe in yourself. Yes, and just what you do, <laughs> and, uh, and just make sure that the other one knows it as well. No, I, 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 I don't. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I mean. I'm not really having an advice. What I can tell you is, and it comes from my experience, that that it's really should be um, a really involved management who is involved into culture and and like like every every part of the the financing of a venue should be run and led by people who is really involved. And if there is a problem within this cogwheel, let's say with the guy who handles all the bar things, or just handle all the subsidy things, or just handle all the bookings, it's not going to work. So I guess that's the most important thing too, that the management should be field persons who is really doing their thing the best. Because if some of them doesn't work, it's just not going to work out generally. I would say that you should be prepared for the marathon, not for a short run. <laughs> That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And um, have a lot of fun while doing all this stuff, building a community and everything. Um, and it can be done, of course. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. It's just very important as well. And admit if you make mistakes. I think that's one of the things which is very important. I have the sticker on my laptop which says I'm okay with failure. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it's you know, it's, it's a bit of a Dutch disease, like <laughs> yeah, the kind of, kind of, kind of <laughs> kind of way of thinking, but it it's it's uh, it works. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I think I can just pick up. Yeah. Um, are any of these venues possible without subsidies? Or do you know of venues that are possible without subsidies and sticking to the program? <coughs> That's an interesting question. <laughs> yeah, we, we at, as um, Class 22 does, does not get any official sub subsidies like for the program, but this, the, the, the place is run by the city of Münster and I am paid by the city of Münster, but we, we don't have any money for the program, so we have all to, um, um, to cover our costs from the ticket sales and from the bar. Yeah. We, on the other hand, um, doesn't, don't have any money for the investments um, and stuff like that, but we have uh, a little bit of money from Ministry of Culture and uh, the city for the program. Uh, and that was my also my thought about this panel. Um, does anybody know anybody, any venue <laughs> that runs solely, you know, on like good programming, a lot of crowd? I, I think it's a problem in Europe altogether, isn't it? A bit, maybe? I mean, I'm, I'm really thankful for the <laughs> subsidies, but I don't know what we would do without them. You have to make choices if you don't have it. So it's not good for I your culture. Think, yeah. So I think in the end, it's not subsidies meant to make sure that you can do a little bit more than just promoting music. That's what I think. We only have 4% subsidy in the total. That's not really, uh, that's not a lot. Yeah, we've got 250 people working at the so that's a lot as well. Yeah, we, we, have the same, we have the same situation and we do not really get any straight subsidies. There is always a service behind why we are getting the money. For example, of course, we have state money, we have government money, but we are in contract with the national television because we produce shows. So nobody ever give us money to, let's say, this amount of money to have a program or this amount of money but to have a new, new BA. It's just not happening. But let's say, as Frank said, um, we have like probably two, three percent of the yearly budget as like some real subsidy, but we're not getting any more. There's always a service behind it. I just wanted to ask, can it be canalized or not? What do you mean? What do you mean, canalized? From the, you know, because um, you are um, recording the shows, yeah. so can it be canalized? Um, you get the money for that. Can it be canalized yeah, to pay the? But it's but it's in 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 a, it's there's a contract with the band and if the band wants to do it, there's a deal in the contract. Then we produce the show and they can use the agreed part of the recording. Yeah. Okay, but the, the band is not paid by this money. They are having the content. Okay. It's the most important thing. Is there a venue here that's working without subsidies? Or does anyone know one? I know that in Metelkova, Gronka is working with the Gronka Club. You will see it is working mostly without <coughs> subsidies. For some concert cycles they do have subsidies, but mostly they are totally DIY. So go check them out. There's something special in Europe. Okay, we have one minute. So I think it's time to wrap this up. Um, maybe I'll... Uh, give a small summary of what we learned today. Um, we have to work on relationship with local communities and local governments. I think we, there are already some initiatives we can learn from. Uh, there's still some work to do there. The same applies for um, closing down generation gaps. There are also some final initiatives there. Uh, I will tell my Belgian colleagues to make a uh, work of gender balances in their team because uh, it's, uh, <laughs> we've seen today that things can be done differently. Um, we should put mental health uh, of our employees on the agenda. Um, what else? Um, and maybe in the light of growing competition, we should all stay true to ourselves and our identities and keep on working very hard with a lot of love. For revenues? Something like that. Thank you for your attention.